Hi, right, today I want to do a bit on quotes, on quoting in books, nonfiction works in other words. Um, I often have a real problem with uh, people selectively quoting others, which is why I, my approach to these things is to quote extensively, just lay out a big fat, you know, like a paragraph or half a paragraph or even two or three paragraphs. So that you can get a feel for what the person A is really writing, the content, you can contextualize the material, you can get a feel for their way in which they use language, so that you can see, I mean, for example, the word, let's say, imbecile. People talk about the Chinese government being imbecilic uh, 150 years ago, but very quickly you realize that imbecilic does not mean what it means today. Imbecilic means weak. It doesn't mean weak-minded. It means weak of will, weak-willed. Whereas today, imbecilic means stupid, incompetent. In, in those days, it meant incompetent, but it meant incompetent because you were too weak-willed. Not because you were, in, you were fundamentally incapable of doing something. Anyway, so today I want to take a look at, uh, this is the Chinese Opium Wars. This is this particular book. Written by a certain Jack Beeching. Uh, what's good to know about Jack Beeching, Beeching is that he's a former Communist Party recruiter. He was that up until the uh, Cold War, basically, began, and then he uh, retreated tactfully. But I'm sure he was still a communist to the end of his days. And he has a, a very interesting policy of not footnoting anything in his book. Can you believe it? And I'll show you why. But first, let's check out this bit here. This is from his uh, a note on methods and sources at the very end. Explaining away his, uh, his uh, lack of uh, footnotes. Check this out. To append a scholarly apparatus of references to an essay in popular narrative history, compiled from less than 100 sources, all secondary, and in only two languages would be willfully misleading. Really. In other words, to append a scholarly apparatus of references would be willfully misleading. In other words, to put footnotes in it would be willfully misleading. How in the hell would that be true? How is it? How is footnoting willfully misleading? It's quite the contrary, obviously. Yet, the narrative historian writing for the man in the street has valid standards of his own. What? Corresponding to those of the responsible journalist. Who today thinks of, thinks of journalists as being responsible? In the UK, where this clown is from, okay, it was from, he's deceased, um, you know, journalists are called hacks for very good reason, from hard-worn experience, right? They cover too much They cover too much material. They can't possibly care, cover anything in depth, which means they don't really understand what they're talking about on any subject under the sun, period. It's just the way that the business works. You want somebody who understands something, go to an author or a professional. You don't, you don't go to a journalist. And then he rounds it out with, History is the resurrection of the dead. Oh, well, thanks. Another poet. Jesus. This book is only a sketch of a possible beginning. Yeah, what rubbish. Anyway, I'm presuming he ends with that kind of poetic note just because he's trying to, uh, what's the word, uh, distract you from the main issue. Which is also why he kind of, to append a scholarly apparatus of references, blah, 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 would be willfully misleading. Again, he throws in all kinds of crap to kind of to kind of uh, dilute the message that you hopefully won't really notice what he's doing, because he has to go with some kind of excuse, right? No footnotes. I mean, what the hell is that? Okay, so let's t let's take a look at this section here. Okay, to judge by un eyewitness reports, the unofficial plundering of Shanghai as of other cities captured later, went through two stages. First came a certain amount of inevitable picking and stealing, usually from the billets by British soldiers. And here we go. Here's the quote without the footnote. Okay, <clears throat> although the, the original book is easy enough to find because he, he says who the author is. Anyway, the contents of the houses in which their billets chanced to establish them were always, says Lieutenant John Octoloni of the Madras Engineers, carried off as legitimate loot. So in other words, you know, it was always people are, you know, it was legitimate basically to uh, you know, rob and to rifle through people's belongings and uh, take whatever you wanted. That's what he apparently was saying. But what did he really say? Well, here's Octoloni himself. Shocking. So he found the whole thing shocking. Shocking indeed to the antiquarian, meaning himself, he's an antiquarian, the geographer and the lover of science and virtu, where the destruction and spoliations entailed by these promiscuous quarterings of the troops, our troops, in the town successfully occupied. In other words, Oakland doesn't see um, the contents of the houses being being looted as being legitimate loot. <laughs> He's saying the soldiers see it that way, but he himself, you know, was was, was very um, uh, you know peeved by this. He was very put off by it, but he was not in a position to do anything about it. He was an engineer. He wasn't like a commanding officer. Oakland continu continues. The second stage, more devastating, was the systematic plunder of the disorganized city by a mob of Chinese thieves. Much property valuable for its rarity, as well as for its intrinsic worth, 
of course, because Octoloni was an antiquarian, he, he was highly esteemed this, this stuff as Octoloni, was of necessity left behind, and of course abandoned to the gangs of Chinese marauders, which always hung upon our rear when the evacuation of a city was going on, right? Well, um, what's his what's his face? Beach, Beaching here, he can't let that stand. He can't let you know. You can't be blaming the Chinese because he's he's of course pitching this whole war as a melodrama. There's the white hats and, and the black hats, and the English because he's a communist and he opposes capitalism. Then the English must be wearing black hats and the Chinese must be wearing white hats. So the Chinese cannot commit any wrong, you know, with, 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 except for those places where there's absolutely no way of, of actually saving Chinese face. But when he can save it, he always will. And so then he goes on to, so then he immediately switches around from the Chinese marauders and goes back to the British. He goes, defending the habit that British troops had fallen into of looting the houses they occupied, he never defended the habit. Octoloni, as with Pocky logic, the practice of the Chinese of plundering whatever we abstain from touching would have speedily removed all scruples. But as I've shown you, and I'll show you some more, Octoloni never defends this. He's quite the opposite. For example, in this manner must have been destroyed many, this Octoloni, right here, in this manner must have been destroyed many hundreds of books which could they have been collected and preserved until the return of peace allowed their contents to be translated and explained by native linguists. So he wants native Chinese books to be explained by native Chinese people, okay, because he values Chinese literature. Okay. They must have destroyed many hundreds of books, okay, which would have otherwise thrown much valuable light upon the history and present state of Chinese literature, geography, and fine arts, upon all, indeed, that is of interest connected with this wonderful empire. Okay, he's not some—he's not some racist, which is what the left thinks everybody is racist. It's exactly the opposite. Okay, as is the case with almost everybody. You, you, in fact, everybody. I can't think of a single example where I've come across in in the in, in literature prior to let's say the whole racism thing enters into and enters everywhere basically after Darwin, which is 1859. But this book was written in 1844. There is, there's no racism, no hint of racism. In fact, what you see all the time from people of that particular era. That epoch is praised for Chinese this, Chinese that, Chinese civilization, Chinese, Chinese, um, they're the peace, peaceful, peaceful nature, the fact they stress education, they're all mostly, most of the men are literate, um, they, they, they have furniture, they live in good houses, they make delicious food. Everybody knew this. It's not that there's, you know, there's this idea that the left likes to propagate that the British were just a bunch of, you know, beef eating buffoons, you know, eating oxtail you know, stew and shepherd's pie, and that was the extent of the national cuisine. And they just they went over to China, and they were just like kind of shocked and awed, and, and decided, well, they were that they were so so jealous of of Jeff Chinese achievements and accomplishments that they had to look that manufacturers used to look down on them and you know make fun of them and call them celestials and and all the rest of it. But again, the the, the racist. Um, uh, what do you call it? Terminology, you know, slants, gooks, this kind of stuff. This this stuff you have to wait until the 1880s, 1890s for it to appear. It wasn't it wasn't apparent at this time at all because people hadn't learned to be racist yet because racism is something which is learned, um, not uh, it's, not, it's not natural. Anyway, to continue with Octoloni, couches used to be made with the torn up leaves of books. Fires fed with them. So people are setting fires or or feeding their fires. You know, whether they make cooking food or staying warm, whatever else with with books. You know, all sorts of horrors, in short, were perpetrated with these precious pages. Okay, and, and for example, if we look at, for example, the, the commander-in-chief in theater was a guy called uh, Hugh, uh, what's his name, uh, Viscount Guff, I think is how you pronounce it. Anyway, here's what he wrote about the situation. For example, right, this is his The Life and Campaigns of Hugh, First Viscount, Viscount Guff, Field Marshal, Volume 1. It's written in 1903. Uh, based on the uh, the letters, uh, the diaries of um, uh, the Viscount. He, this, again, this is the general in charge of the, uh, the, the the armed forces on land. The sight about me now, he says, writing from the Citadel of Amoy, that's contemporary shaman today, on September 4, this would be probably 1841, I'm guessing, is heart-rending. Every house broken open and plundered, in most instances by the Chinese robbers, of whom there are 20,000 now in the town, ready to sack at the moment that we leave. I have had many, this is interesting, I have had many conferences with the respectable Chinese merchants, urging them to aid me. Right? And down here in the footnote, Sir Hugh asked the merchants to appoint four men whom he might place at the gates in order to distinguish householders from mere plunderers. And this they declined to do. So in other words, what he did is he got the city, the city gates. He wants the merchants to appoint four reliable guys who can distinguish who lives in the city and who does not. This way, they can they can they can you know weed out the the, the, the crooks from, from getting in from because the people who are mostly stealing stuff from the cities, of course, are not from the cities themselves because the cities are reasonably small. People know each other, right? They're people from outside, okay? Who come, you know, to, you know if everything from vagrants to opportunists, right? Anyway, and then he says, well, they declined to help. Well, so why would they decline to help? 
you're, you're thinking, oh, well, Hugh just made this up. No, he didn't make it up. I, at least I don't. I presume he didn't make it up. I wasn't there, of course. I, I can't say for absolutely sure, but I presume he's, he's, what he's saying is, is uh, reliable <clears throat> because I know how, how the system worked. China at the time was not China. It was the Qing Dynasty. China was a province which was occupied, which was swallowed up by the Qing Dynasty, which was established um, uh, what uh, sixteen sixteen I think or sixteen twenty one. Uh, which then swallowed up China, swallowed up Mongolia, swallowed up Tibet, and would also swallow up Xinjiang, right? And so China was basically a province, okay, of the empire. And the empire had three capitals: Beijing, which was one, was just one capital, okay, of three. Um, it became the main one, but nevertheless, it was just one of three capitals. Anyway, the the Manchus were running China. The Manchus are not Chinese. They don't speak Chinese. They don't read Chinese. They have their own written language. They have their own spoken language. Different people. Right, and if you were found aiding and abetting or co collaborating in any way, shape, or form with the with the uh, the English after the war was over, the Manchus t took back power over, over the cities. Okay, you would be considered a traitor. You would be you would be killed. So nobody could afford to be seen co collaborating with the British. So there was no way for General Guff to to assign Chinese respectable people in the town to assign them to the city gates to just to keep out crooks. There was no way to do it, and so there was nothing you could do about the place being looted. Okay, to continue. The moment a house is broken open, what between Chinese soldiers as English soldiers or followers as Chinese people who they would employ while they were there to wash dishes, clean clothes, and things of that nature, every article is destroyed by either the Chinese, British soldiers, or the, the followers, the camp followers. The wanton waste of valuable property is heartrending and has quite sickened me of war. I have punished to a great extent both soldiers, followers, and Chinese, some of the latter three or four times. For the first two days, the soldiers, as English soldiers, were well in hand. But when they found we were to give up the place and saw the crowds of miscreants ready to plunder every house the moment we turned our backs, it has been most difficult to restrain them. Anyway, so back to beaching. So you can see what I'm, what I'm getting at. Here he, here he would have you believe that Octoloni is saying that um, the contents of the houses in which the billets chanced to establish as British soldiers, the contents of the houses in which the billets chanced to establish them were always carried off as legitimate loot. Uh, no, they were not. It was not legitimate loot. It was legitimized by the soldiers, but the, the general was certainly not in favor of this. You, you, you punish people for doing this, and this guy's an engineer. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, Octoloni is an engineer. Can you imagine an engineer delighting at people destroying houses, destroying property, knocking down the interior de decor of a place, and just just you know ravaging it? How on, how on earth could a, could an engineer, a guy who actually puts things up, he erects structures, he's, he's I'm sure he's interested also in interior decoration, things of that nature. How could a guy with this kind of background possibly agree with loot and destruction? It makes no sense. Why you know at all if you think about it. But of course, one of the reasons why this the kind of thing doesn't even occur, I'm sure, to people like Beeching, is, is because he likes poetry and poets. Anyway, I've gotten into my issue with poets before. I'll, I'll, I'll save you the beating the dead horse in this uh, video. And again, Octoloni is not defending the habit of British troops. He's, 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 he's explaining it. He's rationalizing it. He's not defending it. <laughs> it's just totally, totally ridiculous. Anyway, so my, my, my point is, again, this is the reason why when I tend to quote things in my book on the, on the Chinese Opium War, my politically incorrect history of, the, of our introduction to the first Opium War, um, I, I include lengthy uh, quotes. So again, that you can actually figure out what the person really means. So you can get, this, you can get the subtext if there is one, the quote-unquote dog whistles if they're there, uh, the, the contextualizing of things. So you can get an idea of what the person's really, really about. Because this whole idea of white hats versus black hats in the Opium War is just insane. Because the British didn't go there. Uh, just I'll, I'll leave that for another video. But um, they're they're very. Eighteen thirties was a very modern time in in British history. You know, you know, you've mass education, compulsory education for children in Scotland starting in the eighteen twenties, for example. Um, you've got you know you've got canals. You've got. Uh, I mean, the whole the whole thing with Dickens. We we read you know Dickens describing uh, Britain. About, you know the Industrial Revolution. He's not describing the Industrial Revolution. He's describing the pre-Industrial Revolution. He's describing England of the 18 teens and the 18 early 1820s when he was a, rep a roving reporter. He doesn't mention gunpowder. Doesn't mention canals. Doesn't mention any of the modern devices, which changed England much for the better. Um, and England just England really became in the 1830s became a modern country. And so, but it was remember it banned slavery in, in the 1830s as well. Uh, it, it disbanded the, um, the the British East India Company because they had too much power. It was all you know, ending monopoly powers and things of this nature, uh, expanding the vote. Um, so the idea that the, the British in, in 1840, when they went into to China, were just going like a bunch of savages ravaging the place is just ridiculous. Anyway, I hope I said something useful. Uh, if you like what you what you see, please hit the um, what's it called the sign up the something button. You know what I'm talking about, register button, whatever it's called. And I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye bye.